All right, so I'm Ryan, otherwise known as the man in his music, as most people probably know by now. Um, but today I'm gonna do my next recent jazz vinyl finds. I think my last one was um, September 13th. I'm not sure which number I'm at once again um, on this one. But in the video I got playing Trin's First Ride Volume 2, a record that I was after for probably about three or four years now. I picked up the CD to complete Coltrane's discography and I featured that in, uh, in my video. Um, for the complete discography, but I ended up picking up two copies of Train's First Ride on vinyl. Um, it's kind of ironic too, because I think the last sale before these two was like 2018 or 2019. Um, and I, I had been sending people on Discogs like tons of messages. I don't mean to be like, you know, intrusive with asking about things like this, but when I was trying to complete the discography, I was emailing people asking, you know, if I could purchase it. And I had a few people, um, they were tempted, but none, none of them really pulled through. Um, but luckily I ended up with both of these for like around $30 each. And I knew people would probably give me some flack for doubling up on my, um, not only these two, but my 45s and 78s, cold, early cold train material. But um, if you look at the auctions and discogs, I mean, I guess you can't really see how long something is sat on Discogs, but the auctions are usually me, um, just one bidder um, winning them, and I don't usually have to fight with anybody to try and grab these. And then the ones on Discogs, I usually wait a little bit, at least the ones that I have um, and have good copies of, I wait a little bit just so, you know, somebody out there, if they don't have it, they can pick it up. But I mean, of course, if I see it on there for a deal, like 50% below the, the going rate that, I mean, at least that I would presume, I would probably pick it up and send it out to somebody, another diehard Coltrane collector, at least eventually. So anyway, I'm gonna start the video off with some more kind of Coltrane-esque related material. Coltrane doesn't appear on this, but if you watch my Coltrane discography video, and I mentioned the Col Coatesville Harris Orchestra appearance that Coltrane had in like, 53, 52, there's no confirmed date on it. Um, but that appearance was on Nestor, which was a record label out of Philadelphia, a re relatively small record label. Um, if you go on Safari, you can find some very small, like minute details about it, which is pretty sad, given the fact that the material, at least because I have another Nestor bootleg and all the material that I've heard off of that label is super, super good, underrated. Um, it sucks that it's not more, like, more available, um, cause this one, I went on Pop Psych and I went on Discogs, there's nothing on it about this one. This is, uh, Butch Ballard Trio with, um, vocals by Peggy Morgan, um, but I picked this up thinking that Coltrane might be on it. One, for the fact that it's on the Nestor record label, but another, uh, reason was the writer of all four of the, the songs was, uh, under H. Gillespie, or I think it was Howard Gillespie, which was um, the writer, but I'm not too sure. So I was just, I had my fingers crossed, hoping that I would hear some undiscovered Coltrane, but it, luckily um, it's still, you know, I still got some good material, but it didn't, it didn't really work out for me um, with that. So the next one I got um, is King Solomon's Indian Summer and Moon Glow. Um, if you know anything about Clifford Brown's work overseas and then his work with Lionel Hampton, um, the name King Solomon probably sounds familiar, but this is his only release. Um, it's on a 45 only. I don't think there was a 78 or anything like that, but super good stuff. Nothing too crazy. I thought Clifford Brown was appearing on this. I thought, you know, I heard it somewhere, but I was wrong and it's it's still super rare. I think there's there was like three or four like sold uh, listings on Discogs, but nobody added it to their collection, so that kind of confused me. But um, I'm the only one now that has it added to um, their collection. So either way, I'm pretty happy with it because you know while I also did take a risk trying to get some more Clifford Brown material, um, still super good. Uh, two sides so and plus um, I couldn't really get an idea of who King Solomon was through the other recordings so I wanted something to kind of see uh, you know 
what kind of maybe leader he was or um, what kind of tracks he um, was going for. So another Coltrane appearance that I got is Bittersweet um, by Gay Cross. And then the other side was Fat Sam from Birmingham. Now this was on a 45 and a 78, um, but I got the material to complete the Coltrane discography on a CD. So, uh, well actually, yeah, it was a CD uh, called Train, or no, Rare Train Tracks. And it had a few other like rare live recordings and then like a few other 78 uh, appearances like, like with Billy Valentine and stuff like that. But um, super happy to have this like on the official format. Um, you know public release rather than a bootleg so nothing too crazy in terms of early coltrane because for some reason on that record you can't really get an idea of you know there's not a lot of solos or you can't hear them out front um in the group but once they move from gotham to republic with the gay cross and the good humor sex you can still um well not still you can hear more Coltrane solos and you can you can definitely get an idea that he's like they kind of got a focus shifted on him and it's um it's pretty cool to see that you know how it kind of changed because I think it was like a year or two gap between Gotham and Republic so I guess I'll just get into um my actual records I got here the first one Blossom Deary Needlepoint Magic um on Master Mix rather than the original label which was Daffodil Records um, this is volume five and once um i think it hit like volume three um on daffodil blossom jury was releasing live sets um as albums not that there was anything wrong with that but um this is still like super good stuff a lot of classics that she recorded while she was signed to fontana like um i'm hip uh i like you you're nice um, i'm shadowing you uh sweet georgie fame but um the one that i really um enjoyed on here was lush life and you could kind of hear her talking about it during the live set i think she said that she was learning it for like 20 years before she wanted to play it live so i was super impressed with that i'm sure that anybody would be if you know if you go and um i think it's on spotify i'm not too sure but um either way pick it up because it's super cheap you can get it on um uh, master mix records which is the alternate label, or you can get it on Daffodil. Um, I think this is a UK um, pressing. I'm not too sure though, because I seen some other listings, um, which were also sold overseas. I picked this one up um, from the UK, but the other ones that were sold overseas were signed. So maybe they had like, um, maybe they bought like a lot of them and then were selling them at a uh, concert or something like that. But that's my third uh, sign, Blossom Deary, like volume set. So maybe I can get the rest of them signed. I'm not too sure. Um, they're kind of hard to come by though. I got that for like seven bucks though, which surprised me. And uh, my friend Donovan, he he seen that I picked that up, and um, well, I he I was telling him about the fact that I picked this record up, but when he went on eBay, he seen that that went for like seven bucks, and he think he thought I was referring to that. But I was actually referring to this, which I picked up off of Discogs for like $35, I think. Um, and I was super glad to because this is my favorite Blossom Beery album of all time. I think My Gentleman Friend is probably number two, but this one is just filled with amazing tracks um, by the underrated writers, Comden and Green. Um, but one of my favorite things about this record is you have Kenny Burrell um, appearing here with, um, I think it's... Is it Ed? Yeah, Ed to Piggin, um, or Ed Thigpen, however you pronounce his name. And then Ray Brown, who was always a staple of that group. But this is original mono copy. I, I kind of wanted a stereo, but um, this will do for now. Because, I mean, <laughs> it was kind of hard to grab this album, at least. Um, super happy to get it for a deal, though. It was like VG to VG+. Plus. So, next record I got... Um, some classic soul jazz with an appearance by Larry Young, who was listed on this record as, I think it was Lawrence Wilkes. Um, yeah, Lawrence, or no, Lawrence Olds on organ. Um, but um, the other, another familiar name I see on here is Donald Bailey. But then um, Thornal Schwartz and 
um, Bill Leslie, they're kind of, at least, I don't really know anything about them. And I went on Discogs and tried to find some more releases by them, but couldn't really see much. So I'm guessing this is their only album. Um, if anybody knows anything about um, either of them, um, you know, if you commented, I'm, I'm, I would definitely appreciate that. But super good stuff, but nothing like, you know, out of the water or anything like that. I, th I mainly picked it up for the fact that Larry Young appeared here. Um, super glad to have it, have it though. I paid like $55 for it, which it seems to be going up in price. But I, I figured that for a VG Plus copy, uh, 50, around $50 was all right. So the next one I got here um, was one that was sent to me by my great friend Donovan. And he's, he sent me a few other things, but um, this one was probably one of my favorites. Super good Charles Tolliver stuff. Um, I had another Charles Tolliver release. I think it was called, uh, it was Compassion, but I ended up selling it just because it, it didn't really impress me. I mean, it, it did at first, but it kind of just got, it kind of just got old, I guess. Um, and the pressing wasn't my favorite either. I think it was like one of those later uh, Strata East releases, but this is Live at Slugs Volume 2. Um, I'll probably end up going for Volume 1 maybe i think i think there's a volume three um but i didn't know anything about this until trent trent's records told me about this um i'll link him down in the um, description as well as um donovan's accounts too because uh i have to thank him for all the records that he's given me throughout the past year we've been trading some things back and forth and if you go watch his videos you'll, you'll see some of the things that i've sent him and i also have a few things and here, I think I have two records that I'll be showing that I'm sending him. So Donovan, if you're watching, maybe you wanna skip over it to kind of have it as a surprise. I'm not too sure, that's up to you though. But um, thank you for sending this to me because this is one that I've um, definitely been enjoying the past couple months. Well, not the, I think it's been like a month and a half since you sent this to me, but I've been spinning it almost nonstop. I've had it close to my turntable with a few other albums, just for the fact that it's always, um, always playing it. But next one I got from Donovan, uh, the jazz organs with Jack Wilson. And then, um, I don't, I forget who the other one was, but I seen this by, um, I think Chris, what Cam Brown posted it. Um, I think somebody put it on eBay for a little bit of a deal and I, I eyed it for a little bit and I added it to my want list. And then next thing you know, Donovan sent me this copy. Super happy with it, super good material. I, I think I listened to like one track before I got the record, but um, it's so good. Kind of kind of surprises me that it's super cheap though. Um, but I think I, I think that's the original, not too sure. It didn't have a deep groove. So I think it was like a 67 release maybe. Maybe it was recorded earlier and released later, but I got, three records here by an artist that I've been getting into a lot lately, um, Julie Andrews. I think I showed a few things in my last video um, of hers, but I got her Christmas um, Fire, yeah, Firestone a little volume release, which was uh, super cheap. I think I paid like $2 for it, and the disc is near mint. Um, super happy to have it. Although it, it was reissued, and I think it was um, reissued on better quality vinyl from what I've seen. But uh, I guess you could say this is the original. Not that it really matters, given the fact that, you know, it's super cheap stuff and um, easily obtainable. But super happy to have it, especially around Christmas time. Because I'm sure those um, near mint copies and VG Plus copies will go pretty fast here soon. So then I got Broadway's Fair, Julie Andrews. Uh, I think this one was like VG plus. I'll probably aim for another copy, um, but it's, it's probably clean enough for me. But the fact that they're super cheap kind of has me going for the tip top near mint copies. So I got that. And then I also got uh, uh, Don't Go in the Lion's Cage tonight. Um, it kind of has a lot of uh, British uh, tracks. A lot of things that were popular overseas um, I think like maybe in the 30s or 40s because I think this is like more of like a novelty uh, record as compared to you know 
contemporary uh, music and stuff like that. So another one I got from Donovan was The Adventurer by Clifford Jordan. Um, another one that kind of surprised me because I, I never knew this existed, had no idea, um, but it's super good material. I think he appears with Kenny Dorham, or no, no, no. I'm thinking of another release that I got in here. Kenny Dorham, I think, passed away by this time. He appears with uh, Tommy Flanagan, Grady Tate, and Bill Lee. Um, so, love that session. Definitely surprised me when I first spun it, because I thought it was like a little bit of a later era for Clifford Jordan. You know, by the time that he kind of changed his sound a little bit, but super, super good stuff. Um, makes me want to pick up his stuff on Strata East a little bit more, like glass beads. But next I got The Amazing Bud Pal, Volume 5, The Scene Changes. Um, I think the classic uh, records pressing came out a little earlier this year. Maybe it was like two or three months ago. But I picked up this UA stereo pressing. Uh, super happy with it. But when I first went to spin it, it had a, like a, or was it a skip? Maybe, I th no, I think I got stuck. Um, it was getting stuck at like the end of side two. So I got to the end, got a little bit disappointed, but then I ended up fixing it luckily. Um, although it still kind of has a little bit of noise. So my favorite release that I got from Donovan in the last um, pack that he sent me was um, Art Pepper Plus 11, Modern Jazz Classics. A lot of good stuff written by like Gillespie, Monk, Mulligan, Charlie Parker, Sonny Rollins. I mean, you can see on the cover there. Um, I don't know why my camera's blurry, but on the sleeve, who had, the previous owner had like taped some things. Um, I guess I'm thinking from like Downbeat Magazine. So I thought that was pretty neat. Got to read that. Um, hopefully I, they don't fly off there, but been enjoying this one lately too. Um, super clean. I, I was kind of surprised that Donovan sent this to me because I thought, um, I remember when he first picked this up and I, I thought he was gonna, you know, I thought it would be his forever copy, but super glad, um, you know, he sent it to me and, uh, I'm definitely going to be paying him back here soon with uh, a few records I got in this video. And then um, a few more titles uh, that I got on the shelf over there that I can't really surprise him just yet. So then I got Milt Jackson and the Big Brass um, on Riverside, Red Label. I think this is a reissue, I'm not too sure. Uh, haven't really spun it, to be honest. I think it was like a freebie that somebody sent me in a package. Um, I think it was along with this one. So remember, or Reminiscent by Gigi Grice, uh, kind of another one that surprised me because Gigi Grice kind of like fell out of um, recording after his like prestige and uh, new jazz uh, era. But this is on Mercury. Um, oh, it's kind of got a bigger, it's not a big band, but it, I mean, you can see it's Orctet. So there's a lot more players appearing here. And I, I think it's, it's not really for me to be honest because um, I like a smaller group where you can kind of get an idea of each player and you know there's like some individuality um, between each of their solos and stuff rather than you know one loud noise and one group um, acting as you know one. So then uh, I think this is the last release that Donovan sent me. Uh, Looking Ahead by the Jazz Crusaders. When I first spun this it kind of reminded me of uh, Curtis Fuller's Soul Trombone. So I kind of keep this next to that because um, it's like as soon as I get done spinning Soul Trombone, I go to this because it's um, you get the same feel, like I said. Um, it's super enjoyable stuff. I think it's got like a hard bop feel um, mixed with maybe like kind of like I don't know. It just kind of feels like it's more on the end of maybe modal, I would say. But um, love it. Super good stuff. I need to get more of the Jazz Crusaders. I, th I think their stuff is relatively cheap too. Um, definitely overlooked. The next one I got is uh, Billy Poole um, on Riverside. Vocal session with uh, Kenny Burrell and uh, Junior Mance. I think I picked this up from a seller in Mexico and it took like two or three months to get to me, which I kind of forgot about it. And then it showed up to my doorstep and I was just like, okay. 
like spun it and um i, I think i was like because i think it's vg so i wasn't impressed but um super good material i'll, I'll probably end up aiming for another copy because um i do like the songs and um but i just don't like hearing uh at least any any record with junior mance i kind of want in vg plus condition because the way that he plays the piano and especially the fact you got vocals and guitar on there but next one i got uh ravel um, i'm not sure how to pronounce the artist's name ivo uh pogo relic i think but uh i've been getting into him because my friend michael farina who's a big big diehard coltrane fan um was telling me about how coltrane created giant steps wrote giant steps based off of um ravel's um on dean i think that's how you pronounce it i think it was number six yeah i think yeah on dean um gaspar de la Nuit. yeah um so i picked that up because i thought the you know the whatever that that track i i just thought it was um pretty good and you can you can really hear where coltrane picked up um on what Ravel was doing um, back in like the early um, 1900s. And I think, because Ravel was born in uh, 1876, so maybe it was like before the 1900s, I'm not too sure. But super happy to have that because you can kind of get an idea, like I said, of what Co Coltrane was doing with Giant Steps. And I think there's one other um, uh, source that Coltrane form some ideas for giant steps i'm not too sure what that one is maybe i'll buy the record and feature it in my next video but um next one i got here is ease it kenny dorham i think this was was it walt bishop uh yeah walt bishop this was a walt bishop session on um jazz time i think um uh, maybe anybody can correct me in the comments I'm maybe i think i may be wrong on that um but uh this one is on Muse Records called Ease It. So I guess most people probably didn't know who Walt Bishop was. And um, Muse probably wanted some more coverage and sales. So they put it under Kenny Dorham's name. But super good session. Uh, nothing too crazy though. Just like something to spin every once in a while. So the ones I got for Donovan. I picked this up a little bit ago. Um, Coltrane Live at the Village Vanguard. This is an original stereo copy. I have an original mono, um, but I figured I'd pick him the stereo copy. I, I mean, I seen it for a deal, and I, I wasn't going to let it go because um, he doesn't have too, too many of the free jazz uh, Coltrane impulse releases, so I figured that would be a good one for him to have in his collection. So I picked that up. I'd say it's about VG to VG+. Plus. And then I also grabbed this Clifford Brown and Max Roach um, release on Basin Street. Uh, I was kind of confused though when I when I first seen this like a few years ago. I was like, is this a live session? But it's it's not. It's with um, Sonny Rollins and you know just that group. Uh, I think yeah, Richie Powell is the pianist on there, uh, and George Morrow on bass. Uh, probably one of my favorite Clifford Brown and Sonny Rollins releases, uh, at least after. Um, Harold Land had left the group, but I have another copy. Um, so Donovan, I'm gonna be sending this one to you. And then a few other things too, which I'm not gonna show in the video just yet, just so you can kind of get the aspect of a surprise. So anyway, if you watched, you know, all 24 minutes of this, thank you. Um, thank, I wanna thank everybody for getting me to a thousand subscribers. And if you haven't watched my last video, you can go watch that and comment for the giveaway for uh, a little bit of a rare Coltrane uh, CD release that I picked up. Uh, I think I doubled up on it uh, maybe a month or two ago. And I was like, you know, I, I don't need this one because I, I picked up another CD with the entire date. But um, I think it was like my favorite date overseas, November 4th, 1963. So I will be posting the results or the giveaway winner um, on that video in the comments. And then, like I said in the beginning of the video, I'll probably do um, my favorite Coltrane memorabilia around that time and just, you know, just to announce um, the winner. And also, I kind of want to get into 
um, things that aren't records. So like um, my Coltrane ads and posters and uh, stuff like that. So thank you.